right. Welcome, everyone, to Politically High Tech with your host, Elias. This is episode 187. I have a guest here who has very, very, very wealthy experience, especially with tech, and I'll even dare add career development. Okay, very, very rich there. I looked it up. I'm impressed. And I know we don't say this early, but I am definitely planning to get that book because I'm sure there's a few things personally that I could do better. But you know me, I when it comes to a good product, I like to just plug it in as soon as I can um, because I personally think it's going to be helpful. If I don't find anything that's helpful, I'm only wait till the end if it's okay. And if it's very bad, I really don't care if I forget. <laughs> Maybe that's intentional. Not this product here. Um, And I've heard some even good things about it. And the only thing I'm going to tease a little bit is that it's not a linear kind of book. But enough said. Enough said. Um. Because I don't want to be focusing on the book or maybe until later on or when the plugin is close to perfect. So I have a guest here and I might butcher his name because I didn't bother to ask for names like I normally do. You know me, listeners. I try to be a perfectionist, but it always falls apart. Probably I'm hardwired that way. Oh, well. I have Mark Heshberg, if I got it right. Pretty close. Hershberg. Hershberg. Almost like Hershey. Okay. Mnemonic device it's like Hershey, which has been a long standing nickname. Yeah, <laughs> oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't think me was at that level yet. I was going, Oh, Mark Hershey, no, 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 no. I, I'm gonna maintain a respectful lease beginning with, with that. No, no, so he's gonna share about his um introduction because if I know if I start touching a little bit into it, it will do some disservice. I mean, he has so many um talents when it comes to maybe he could be the modern Renaissance man or the modern multi-talent man. So we probably need something to replace Renaissance. The Renaissance implies that it's 14th, 15th century. You know, that's something I think we could do this uh, update to update our vocabulary there. But um yeah, then, you know, just go introduce yourself. Sure. Well, thank you for having me on. You are welcome to call me Hershey. I go by Mark. I go by Hershey, whatever is easier. I have a very interesting background. I have this dual path in my life. So my primary focus, I graduated from MIT back in the 90s during the dot-com era and started as a software engineer. I advanced my career. I've become a CTO and I've been at traditional classic Silicon Valley type startups, but also Fortune 500s who wanted to play startup and innovate. Sometimes I'm in-house, sometimes I'm consulting. These days I'm a fractional CTO and have some startups and personal projects that I'm working on. So that's been my main career. Now, a funny thing happened on the way to my career. I knew early on when I wanted to become a CTO early in my career, I said, to be one, there's a bunch of skills I need. It's not just about being a good engineer. Certainly I need to do that. But there are other skills like leadership, networking, negotiating, team building, stuff I've heard of, but no one ever taught them to me. So when I began to look at my career, so I have to train myself, quickly realized these skills apply to non-executives as well and began to train up my team. And as I was doing this, MIT came along and said, we're doing the same thing. We've got this feedback from companies saying they want to see these skills and they can't find it, not just with engineers, not just with new college grads, with everyone. So we put together a program 20 plus years ago to get these skills into our students. And I've been teaching there ever since, totally unexpectedly. That turned into my book, The Career Toolkit, and the app now, the Brain Bump app. And so in parallel to building tech startup, and I'll talk about tech startups a little more in a moment, I've also been teaching these professional skills. Now, within the tech world, my background, my graduate work was in cybersecurity, and I've been in and out of cybersecurity. I've run AI machine learning teams for over 10 years. Some of my patents touch upon AI and machine learning. So I've been in and out of that space as well. Ah, yep. So you see why I didn't do the introduction, listener, or do you, for, well, for the audio listeners, do you hear why? Do you hear why? I'm sure I was going to just say, oh, he's a CTO, MIT professor, and all that. And yet, yeah, no, no, I think, nah, of course you killed it with the introduction. So that's why I didn't do it. Sometimes I just know when to just stay in my own lane because when I have an instinct that I'm going to butcher it, I don't want to be in the way. Okay. Um, that's just me. Uh, but if I'm confident going to do something, then nah, of course I initiate, but that that's just not the case, right? If a person's real simple, 
just like the last episode about the AI using AI for predictive behavior, how to make more sports gambling decisions. Now I was confident. Very easy introduction. And they, of course, I'll out elaborate. But this one here, I'm just giving you a little bit of a difference. If it's if it's very extensive, nah, let them do that. Um, of course, they could do that much better than me. That's their experience, not mine. So I already, before we even did the recording, I already gave them a little hint or even sprinkle, if you will, if you want to use a more culinary term, of about AI, people's skepticism of AI or fear of AI. You already know me, listeners. I'm a cautious optimist when it comes to AI. Um, even though, ironically, I'm a Christian, so I, of course, I get blowback from hardcore Christian organizations that sees as a new Terminator, Skynet, or iRobot gone crazy, or you know, the Age of Ultron, whatever nerd example that. <laughs> that depicts AI, robotics, you know, either want to dominate humanity or wipe out humanity altogether because they see us as flawed, crazy organisms, okay? I know some of you still have that thinking, but if this was mostly a Gen Z audience, I'm sure most most of them might not even have that thinking, but I know y'all yeah, towards my age group, the millennial group, and the Gen X primarily, I know some of you got concerns, or some of you is even embracing it really. You know, I want to address those who are still fearful of it because you lay that fear hold back. And then according to history, but just a little history nod, technological disruptions happened. Car was a big thing <laughs> over a century ago. Okay. Or if you want to go even further back when I talked about how wiping off feces off the castle was a viable job during medieval times. We don't need that anymore. We have the sewer system. Okay. So of course, certain jobs are going to go away, but new ones come. And based on my recent optimism, because normally I'm not optimist, it comes out more than what they replace. Now I just noticed that after thinking of it clear and with more optimism, I don't want to give you false hope either. I'm not that type of person. But you know, um, just because, you know, by over, I was, this is hypothetical, of course, over 100 million jobs will be gone. Maybe 150 million will come associated with AI or some new technology or careers that are, you know, that have short staff, like pilots, teachers, even some more traditional than that. Healthcare, forget it. <laughs> they got so much shortage there. It's crazy. It's actually scary, but I don't want to drag this podcast in the mud. You get the point. Of course, this, of course, change always causes disruption. But once, but we are humans, we are adaptable, right? We are adaptable. We can learn this thing. We really can. So before I turn this into a seminar about convincing you become AI experts overnight, which trust me, I'm I'm not an AI expert either, but I am learning the tool and it's mostly great. And it's helped me create a funny Thanksgiving turkey. If I put the prompt wrong, I wanted the turkey just to beg, just like a live turkey. But what he did say was a dead turkey praying and said, I said, you know, I kept it because it was comedic. It was hilarious. So, you know, I kept it. It was unintentional to get that result, but I loved it. I put it there by Thanksgiving up, so I'm proud of that AI art that I generated. It's dead. It's so ironic because it's praying to not to be killed, but it's already dead. So it's it's funny. And it's a little nod against my Christianity a little bit. So, so I already laid out about people's skepticism and fear here. And let's try to at least reduce skepticism or downright fear of AI. What can humanity prepare for what well, I'm going to dare call the AI revolution? Well, we can indeed prepare for it. And I think you really provide a great framework, which is we have to look at history. You gave some good examples. One of my favorites, of course, the Industrial Revolution. When America was founded, we were 80 to 90% farmers. Most of us lived and worked on farms. Then we have the Industrial Revolution and we start to automate that farm work, the cotton gin being the most famous example. And we suddenly said, we don't need people on the farms. Today, it's somewhere around 6 or 8% of Americans are working on farms. So if we were all sitting around saying, I want to be a farmer, guess what? There's not enough jobs and we'd be in trouble. But most people I know are not saying, I wish I could be a farmer. In fact, they're saying, boy, I wish I could work in social media. That's a cool job. I sit in an office, I make posts. Guess what? That job wouldn't exist if we didn't have technological innovations, not only that we don't need you as a farmer, but creating computers and the internet so you can do these things. And so what we see, as you've pointed out, 
over time, we lose certain jobs as they get automated. We add newer jobs. But here's the catch. In the past, when we look at farming, we went from roughly 75% farmers to 25% farmers over about 100 years. And so it wasn't that one day everyone woke up and said, oh, you're laying me off as a farm worker. It just slowly over time, they needed less or people would leave the farms to go work in the factories. That's where the new jobs were. And it was a somewhat gradual transition. That's not to say there wasn't disruption. There wasn't groups of people saying, I want my jobs and this isn't working, but it happened over a hundred years. The worry is, if something happens much faster. Consider, for example, elevator operator. There was a 10-year period where we went from, you need an elevator operator, to now there's maybe a few thousand in the country. I know here in New York City, where I live, there's a few buildings that keep them for obviously historical reasons, but they could replace them. So we're worried, for example, driverless car. There's about 3 million drivers, professional drivers. I forget if that's taxi drivers or truck drivers or both. But if over let's say three years, we replaced all of them. Suddenly 3 million people, 1% of the population gets displaced and they don't yet have new jobs waiting for them. They're not trained up. So that's the worry. That's what we have to prepare ourselves for. Thankfully, we can look at history and we can find ways to address that. Yeah, uh, you know, I, you know, okay, this is when I throw my East Coast, West Coast beef. This is all... New York, I'm in New York myself, so there you go, a little New York S. Is that the first time it has happened? It's happened a couple of times already. I'm losing count. I remember my first guest was more of a progressive, a very good author, by the way, about how he explored about the porn industry. But you're not going to talk about porn because I'm trying to keep this professional friendly, not family friendly. I don't care about that, but professional friendly. And, you know, if I talk about that, that invites room for the me too and all of that. And I am not in that kind of mood to deal, deal with that. Um, it's, oh, this was real professional. Yeah, I agree. So, but this is a New York-esque episode. Yay! I knew that, but I wanted to act shocked about it. You see, I got to push the Californians away. They've been dominating, doing well in my podcast. So we got to make sure. Come on, so East Coast, we got to represent. All right, enough of my little petty rivalry with the West Side. Um, But you, but you talked about elevator operators. I rarely encounter one. They still exist, but of course, that particular job is at the brink of extinction extinction it's not there yet i'm sure it's gonna get there it's not uh it's not uh if it's when it's going to happen i I met a couple of them few of them friendly few of them snobby that's new york for you but what, what are you gonna do about it it's not like you're gonna um i don't know be with them for an hour so you could just brush off their nastiness you just gotta deal for a few seconds and then they brush off and if they're friendly it's a good conversation well, too bad it was that short. Um, yeah, elevator operators, extremely rare. They're a dying breed um, in terms of jobs. And I think a lot of them are getting ready for retirement, if I'm not mistaken, based on the age range of those folks. I could be a little wrong. I didn't check the statistics, so feel free to correct me. I'm not going to die on that hill. So we need to prepare for, the, of course, this revolution because it's just going to come. It's just going to come. Uh, what's the dramatic example I have said that doesn't work? Well, you could try to live off the grid and go back to BC, but um, I don't think it's a good idea. And just be, just be real. I think most modern people are not just ready for that regression. So I don't, I don't, I don't support that. And so that's what I'm going to say about that. So you already said built up in tech, um, of course, you know, build up the, the relevant skills of, of course, learning with AI, because I, I believe AI is not going to replace people right away, or, you know, at least not initially. But if they don't scale up, then of course, that replacement is going to happen because you just refuse to scale up and be relevant with the market. And, you know, this has been going on for years, Pew. This is not the first time that these disruptions have happened. I re We already gave brief examples. He used the mainstream example which is very very helpful you know from farmers to factory workers but now we are a lot of us are you know be engineers and all that good stuff you know he's a cto so he knows about that stuff more than me but we we thing is we need to learn new skills we got to be open people we got to be open you probably have a talent that was under 
malnourished because you had to stick to that routine for a long time. You know, find that, find that talent, find your strengths. Um, that's why that's why I can advise you. If you're open minded, try to learn AI. Yeah, I can help you. It's help me. Help me create artwork. Otherwise, you know, I'm bad with a paintbrush. A five-year-old could beat me in an art competition. That's how bad I am in art. But with AI, if there was an art competition with AI, my skill could be relevant. You know, so there's hope, people. There's hope. That's what I'm saying. I don't get too long-winded here. But what else people need to do to prepare for this um, re um this revolution besides just skilling up with um AI? Um, anything else you want to add for that, Mark? Let's get a little more specific. So we'll take manufacturing jobs. Now, manufacturing has declined in the U.S. While a lot of politicians argued that had to do with offshore. In fact, the analysis have shown 80%, 87% of the jobs that have disappeared, manufacturing jobs that disappeared in the U.S. were due to automation were due to technological improvement, things like robotics. That's where most of the jobs went. But we haven't gotten rid of all of it. And thankfully, we are reshoring some of what went offshore. There's important reasons for that. But let's think about those jobs. If you go back to 1950, you had people on an assembly line turning screws or hammering nail, doing really basic mechanical work. Today's people on the automotive lines, on the manufacturing lines, they're not turning screws. We have robots that will turn the screws for them. We've replaced that work. And the people we need now in manufacturing are doing higher level manufacturing. In fact, we have a huge shortage of labor, not because we can't find people to turn screws. We've got the robots for that. But it's more sophisticated manufacturing where you can get trained up. It's going to take you six or nine months. There's lots of programs out there that will train you. In fact, these days, they say, you come, we'll lend you the money because we know you're going to get a job. There's such demand. So manufacturing jobs themselves, while we did lose some to automation, the ones we have today are there, but they're a different type of manufacturing jobs, no longer the turning the screw. And this is what we see over and over again with technology. It's not that your job is likely to 100% go away, but it will change. For example, let's take a secretary. I'm just picking this because it's an easy example we can all understand. What does a secretary do? Well, if we think back to 1950s, there was answering the phone. You don't really need that. We can have the AI assistant. We have voicemail. The secretary might schedule a meeting. Again, we see calendar tools. We now know AI assistants can help recommend times. And so that rote task we can get rid of. But if all a secretary was doing is just taking messages and scheduling meetings, yes, yeah, she's not very useful. A good secretary, however, supported the executive, supported whoever she was working for in other ways and would prepare things and help get things done and anticipate and do higher order tasks. And so today's secretary, even though it's a kind of rare job even today, is no longer, let me take a message and let me schedule a meeting. They're going to focus more on these other tasks. And so all of us, when you look at your job, look literally step by step, what is it that you do and which of those things can be automated away? Just as another example, let's take hotels. The check-in process, we already see the check-in process gets automated, just like it does in airports. I don't need to talk to a human, just get me my ticket and great, print it out and I'm good to go. But we still need staff for the more advanced type of interaction. Maybe if I need to change my flight, maybe if I need help with something, and so same, same things in hotels, the checking in, let me take your credit card, here's your room key. You don't need a human for that. We can automate that. But the higher service that we can get from hotel staff, that's where the value is. And it's those skill and that type of work that our jobs will shift to. So whatever your job is, break down task by task. What do I spend time doing? Then thinking what can easily be automated and what is high value that can't be automated that's what you'll be doing more of in the future. The low value and or automatable things, you're going to do less of that. So recognize your job will evolve. And if you can adjust your skills to evolve with it, you're going to be just fine. Oh, yeah, that's very, very, that's very profound. Yep. Because as of now, they could do simple, simple tasks, repetitive tasks. That doesn't require a whole lot of critical thinking. You already said troubleshooting is something that a human... A human is still needed. I mean, airport is such a brilliant example because I dealt with that going to Puerto Rico a couple of months ago. And we made, and then there was a mistake in the ticket. We had it, you know, the, the, and the machine wasn't working. 
So yeah, you need you still need a human being. Just to troubleshoot, make corrections. So what he is saying is, um, well, I don't want to say on point. It's it's accurate. It's actually very true. Um, yep, humans are needed for higher level um stuff. And I and I'm even gonna throw the supermarket when it comes to a few items, the self checkout, it does great. But a human is needed to troubleshoot when the machine is not cooperating, or the customer has trouble using the machine, or even both. So a human is still needed. It's got to up your troubleshooting, critical thinking skills, generally speaking. Well, who knows? Or you could be teaching AI because some of them is teaching AI how to do things too. That's another thing that you'd be doing um, as well. I just want to throw that in there. Um, yeah, stuff that it could be easily done by machine. Yeah, don't, don't worry about that. Focus on stuff that's more complicated that the machine hasn't mastered um yet. Um, cooking, I don't think it's fully mastered cooking, even though some restaurants have been automated. I don't have an opinion yet because I've never been to a fully automated restaurant or fast food um, place yet. I don't have an opinion. If I don't know what it is, I'm not going to have an opinion on it. But one day I'll check it out and see how it is. The, is it better than a human being? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe you could comment on that. Um, do you prefer human touch when it comes to food or automation? You know, that's something... That's something that you could comment on. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts regarding that little um, comment I add to that. Your, your human and AI job shifts. You know, anything you used to do that didn't require a lot of brain power, yeah, that's done. That's with the machine. So just think about something that's not easy to automate, something that's too complicated right now. I shocked that um AI has done well with artwork. I thought that was gonna be the last thing it mastered, but it's doing pretty damn pretty darn good with um artwork so and i thought that was going to be something that is going to be the last thing that it mastered but i was wrong on that one. um so so let me touch on the misinformation thing because you know there's the fear part the ai is going to completely take their job away it's it's created it arises okay get out of the way you obsolete organisms it's time for this fine robots to do your job 10 times faster the CEO don't have to pay me as much. You know, get out of here, you lazy organ. So that, that's what a lot of people was afraid of. And of course, and at the same time, people have to use AI for deceptive practices. That's why it's sadly younger people falling for scams because scams are so convincing. It happened to one of my um, nephews. The AI sounded just like his brother and he provided information. So I got to put both sides in. So how? what can we do just to combat and I'm going to quote a little bit of your word. Um, here, well, par, par, actually, I'm paraphrasing it. The tsunami of misinformation. Because that's a thing. This is the big fear. And it can happen in a few different ways. So let's talk about the different ways. One is simply the volume of information. We've had people post conspiracy theories that are just false. But we know if you say something often enough and loud enough, unfortunately, people will believe it. Now, it used to be most people believed the truth, generally speaking. And then a handful of people would have these fringe theories with no evidence. And we'd say, well, yeah, there, there's always been those people throughout history. Now, the average person who believes what's generally accepted and proven to be true, they don't spend a lot of time posting on their blogs or on the internet saying, but of course the earth is round. I don't bother going around saying that because we know it. But the people who believe in a flat earth they spend a lot of time talking about it. Now, they're limited by how much output they can put there. I'm picking flat earth just as an example. But now, what happens? Well, with AI, I'm still not going to be writing about the earth being round. It's pretty settled for me. I'll just go on with my day. But the people writing about a flat earth, suddenly they can write a lot more. They can produce a hundred times the amount of content, the newsletters, the articles, they can put this all out there. And so even if you're getting fake information, we got to that in a moment, just the sheer volume and the noise can overwhelm people and younger impressionable people. Imagine a 12 year old saying, I keep reading these articles saying the earth is flat. I see so much of it, they might start to believe it because unfortunately people often conflate the accessibility of information with the truthfulness of it. So that's one issue. It's this tsunami of information, including misinformation that'll be put out there. The second is what's known as deep fakes. I can take a picture of the earth and see it looks flat. And I can, of course, make it up using AI. Or I can, for example, impersonate your friend's brother. We can get a lot deeper in that. And it used to be, we've certainly been able to doctor photos for a while, but that was very hard. It was very manual. 
there are ways you could spot it, but we're getting better and better. And so in cybersecurity, we've always had this cat and mouse game that either the offense gets better or the defense gets better and then the other side catches up. Unfortunately, the speed is very fast. And so we are going to see a lot more online scams. Consider when we talk cybersecurity, the biggest cybersecurity risk, 93%, I believe, of cybersecurity attacks start with an email, not some hacker breaking into some back door. It's someone sends an email pretending to be someone else and gets the wrong person to click. And now we can generate those emails much faster in greater volume and more effectively. In fact, I can make a target. So here's a very common scam. I send an email to often a junior person pretending to be from the CEO. And I say, hey, listen, I need to get these $2,000 worth of gift cards. I've got to have it tomorrow morning. Can you tonight? Just use your credit card or use a corporate card and just get to me tonight. This is really critical. And the junior person says, oh, it's a CEO. It's someone important. Of course, I'll do this. I'll send it right away without double checking. But now I can get even more specific because I might take what the CEO or senior person posted about on social media the day before that afternoon and tie that into the message and then say, oh, you saw I'm going to this event tonight. I need this money for that. Well, that... That sounds a lot more convincing. You're being very specific with something known. And I can use AI tools to help gather that information and tie it into the scams and sound much more realistic and effective. So we're going to see, unfortunately, the offense, the bad people in the next few years are going to very rapidly expand their capabilities. And we're going to get overwhelmed with information and misinformation before defenses catch up. Here's an important thing for you to do. I often get phone calls from people saying, hey, this is your bank we're calling about fraud. Or, hey, I'm calling to do a reference check on this person who worked with you. Now, here's the thing. Whenever someone calls you, whenever someone reaches out to you, there is no validation. Because anyone, I can call you and claim to be someone else. I can send you a letter, physical or email, and claim to be someone else. So whenever you have this, when someone says, hey, I am from the bank calling you about this, I say, oh, great. Thank you for letting me know about the fraud. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hang up, call the bank's public number, one I could find in a phone book or these days. We don't use phone books, we find online. I'll call back, I'll contact the fraud department because I know I've dialed the correct number. If someone's calling saying, hey, I'm doing a reference check on this person, I go, great, but before I tell you anything about this person, good or bad, I'm gonna call this person and verify that he or she really told me to disclose this and that you are someone they know and who you say you are. So all of us need to take a moment. Fortunately, it's going to cost us. This is a tax that we can no longer simply trust all the inbound messages. In fact, you might not even know I am really Mark Hirschberg. There's a bunch of stuff out there and you're probably saying, bro, preponderance of the evidence. I've seen other videos that all seem to be him, but you're taking it a little bit on faith. I will note one of my tech startups right now, we're trying to address this very issue where we can bring some of that trust back into it to spare us all this overhead and effort. Oh, yeah, that is scary um, indeed. And I would say even some of the savvy online users are falling for it because it's, it's like you said, they are using facts, make it look as professional and as accurate as possible. Say so here, um, you know, just boom. And that's a, that's a very effective bait. I even almost fell for one, but I caught one because the email address was slightly off. You know, those little sun things I don't pay attention to. Just, wait, 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 wait. What is this? Why is it two dots on calm? You know, some of them are just so subtle. I mean, it's detectable, but it's just, you have to ironically go so, because we are so quick. Instant gratification culture that, that goes against that popular thinking but sometimes you had to take a little slow just check the email i mean this is coming from just a regular consumer perspective which is valuable in its own way yeah check the the email link and well the most obvious ones if you have too much you know grammatical errors i mean those are the real obvious ones you don't respond to those um dump them or delete them what have you. I mean, you're social security, um, you have that background. So you definitely give them a more technical and better advice. And, you know, and they, of course, they try to target the elderly as well, because they know they're not the most proficient. So they, you know, and I, of course, had to help my, well, a few of my older relatives, my family, just to combat against those, those deceptive, emails, video, whatever it is. And then, you, you know, they she almost fell for it, but it was good they had a good relationship. No, if that person is real, you, you try to have a video call, that person refused it. They repeatedly refused 
a video call. That person is fake. This person say work for the UN. It was a doctor in Syria. That sounds a little convincing, but I want a video call just in case. That's some of it sounds too good. Video call. That's what I've done personally, and you know I busted them, and one of them just showed the screen only for like two seconds. It turned off. I said no, that person's fake. That person's faked. So they don't even contact that person, re re report it, whatever. That person's deceptive. Um, yeah, and he was using a picture of uh of a different person, obviously, and make it seem like this person was a doctor or forky for the UN. Um, yeah, that person was fraud. I don't know what country it is. I never got to find that out. I don't want to throw the assumption out there, but that person I just know was fraud because Things in line up. A person, professional person, will not mind getting on the video call just to answer that and other business related inquiries. So that's something I keep in mind. And I've been doing that for a while, even before this became a thing, because certain people were smart with um with um, deceiving us by getting hundreds of thousands of dollars for those poor people that are so lonely and just don't know any better it's sad to see and you know you don't want to be a next victim i'm not even sure dr phil's still doing his show you don't want to be a next victim dr phil as opposed to your embarrassment because you've been scammed by somebody and it's from various countries that are there you know yeah i don't want you to go through that that's embarrassing yeah ma'am and yeah it's really really terrible i'm happy i was able to prevent that from my family members you know, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but I use sense of discretion and I do detect patterns. So that's what I'm going to say about that. Anything else you want to add before I keep rambling on? I'll add a few things you can do. Here's a couple red flags, things to look out for. You pointed out one, which is look at that email address or URL carefully, because often they will use letters from a different character set. Not English, but maybe, for example, Swedish, where letters look very similar, or Romanian or other character sets, where it is an O with an umlaut, or it's an E, but from a different language where the E is angled slightly differently, and you don't notice unless you look carefully. So that's one flag. Another spelling mistake you pointed out, but generative AI will start to reduce that because they can make their English sound better. If you see some suspicious links, or if you see a link before clicking, you can often hover over it without clicking, just hover over it to see the full URL. They sometimes they'll claim to be one URL, but actually links to another. Or you can sometimes right click and save the link and put it not into a browser, but into a text file to look at that link carefully. One of the other things is look at the reply to versus the sender, because often now some people might have you know, an automated reply to that's different, but still, if it looks too different, saying, wow, this is a totally different domain, that's a flag. And finally, they often have some type of time pressure. It's that scam email where the CEO says, I need this by tomorrow morning, or in this case, the fake CEO, or someone saying with the modern kidnapping scams, we have your friend, your brother, whoever who's kidnapped, or the older version, which is help grandma, I'm over in Spain and I lost my wallet and I need money right away. They often put some time pressure because if you have more time, you can get in touch with the person, you can think about it a little more. But when they say you've got hours to do this, that's going to pressure you. It's going to start to get the anxiety in you and you're going to stop thinking quite as rationally. So if there's suddenly a great time pressure, that's another red flag that this might be a scam. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Yeah, but they are suffocating you mentally so you won't be able to think uh, yeah, with those that, yep, I, of course, oh, well, me, I hate being pressured. So I think it's just be by nature. So, okay, I, first of all, I don't know you. What's the situation? I don't know if you could be lying or what, whatever. But, yep, no, they're def they definitely do that. They want it by a few hours. You might, and if they're a little more rational, I just say a little more, tomorrow within 24 hours. But, yeah. No, you're absolutely right, because if you do have time, you'll be able to see through their deceptive um, trickery. Yeah, so they're suffocating you mentally, and don't feel pressure, because that's, that's where they get you. That's why it's good to have a healthy mind, and just take a step back, because if you just do what they say, oh, forget it. They're just getting money out of you, and especially your information they force out of you, and, and if the bank needs something... They will send an official email with a logo. That's why logos are more important than ever. You have to check the logo too. If the logo looks a little funny, <laughs> that's a problem too. I saw a few with, with fake logos, but I don't want to get too deep into that. Um, that's why it's good to check pictures and logos. 
that you know some you know with such regenerative ai they could do things like that too okay let me make it look a little bit like Citibank logo but just changes a teeny bit or whatever and and of course ai is getting in trouble with copyrighted stuff so so far it's not the sharpest in that such with the new york times suing it for improper citation i got throw that article in there again probably like the third time i've done that yeah yeah so let's pay attention to all of of that stuff and uh, of course listen to mark this is not the time for you to be skeptical and stubborn because he has experience here i'm definitely learning something on him as well um i to be i'm a lifelong learner as all humans should be um that's how that's how you get better so there's gonna be a lot more misinformation i mean they already started and one of them got targeted because they did the voice modulation that sounded like someone he knew through a direct message, I believe. And then, of course, um, he fell for it. So be careful, be careful. And there's more younger people falling for it because of the level up of these deceptions until the defenses don't catch up. We're going to have to um, deal with this on um, people real real time on advice for a time being until cybersecurity catches up. And there's a huge demand by that. For that, by the way, there's a huge, huge demand. Uh, just be careful of certification programs with that because someone could be a bit scammy as well. Just so tackle on that. And I saw a few of them. I said, nah, nah, I'm not, I'm not taking that. I'm interested in learning, but I think I have to trust a name like Google through Coursera, for example. That's more of a legitimate source. That's some that that promises you get a job right away, and then you know, all of a sudden they actually for a hefty pay, you know. I don't know if you want to add more anything to that before I move on to the next little topic. I, I think you're spot on with that. What we see when there's new fields is there's a lot of people selling snake oil. In fact, one of my more popular articles was that prompt engineering jobs are a mirage. We hear lots of people talking about, oh, prompt engineering, this is the future. Now, I don't know why people are saying this, because when you actually look at the facts, when you search for prompt engineering jobs, there's a tiny handful, single digits across the U.S., maybe low double digits across the entire U.S. This is not the future. And I don't see a lot of demand for it actually as a job. But what we do see are people selling prompt engineering training classes. Pay me lots of money. I'll teach you to be a prompt engineer for jobs that don't exist, but I'm going to make lots of money in the meantime. And even when there are lots of legitimate jobs, as in cybersecurity, as you noted, that doesn't mean everyone offering to train you is legitimate. We've seen with universities, the diploma mills saying, we'll give you a college degree and you're paying tens of thousands of dollars for a degree no one respects. That's not going to get you a job. So you do have to do your homework. Brand names do matter. I don't mean it has to be the top brand name. It has to be an Ivy, but just a brand name, something with a trustworthy reputation. It doesn't have to be premium. That does matter for education and training. I oh, know. Yeah, yep. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I think uh, there's good top, there's good chunk of the episodes of comp, combating misinformation. I knew it was going to get there, but oof, yeah, it did trigger stuff that, that I forget that I remember regarding um, combating against misinformation in real time, especially, you know, until cybersecurity um, catch some, which I'm sure um, they will at some point. But for the time being, you know, they're not going to wait. They're not going to say, oh, no, let's wait for these social security experts to catch it. No, they're going to just, go, they, they're striking while the iron is hot, these scammers, because they know they're ahead, at least for now. So don't just, just don't expect a thief. You know, that's like a thief coming to your house, you know, and then he has a gun. You know, he's not going to wait for you just, uh, I don't be in your house. You probably might not even be in your house. And it's going to just get an idea that no one is in. They come in there, take. Jewelry is more of an outdated example. Most thievery is online these days. That's the popular, <laughs> that's a popular crime. That's like a thief say, oh, okay, I'm just going to. I'm just going to knock on the door, be nice, and all of that. And then, or actually, a better example. Actually, I have some better. That's like just saying, oh, come in, thief. Please take my stuff. Help yourself. You don't want to become that person. That's, oh, yes, here, here, here's 10000 Here's $10,000. You know, you, you work, most of you work hard for that money. So here, 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 here's my identity and everything. You know, you don't want to do that. That's what you're doing when, 
when you're not alert. You're just giving valuable information and even financial assets to the thief. So if it's like, oh, please come in, come in, go check my address, go check on my secret, uh, confidential stuff. That's what you're doing through the email. You're just giving them access to your personal electronic hub of information and even money. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to give them a, a free pass. No, that's ridiculous. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Um, yeah. So I, wow, wow. Yeah, I got no more. I got no more things to add about that. I, th I think that covers a lot of it. Unless you got any more nuggets you want to add into that, um, feel free. I'll just throw in, you leave a lot of information out there through social media. And this is whether you're answering one of those questions. Oh, if you tell us you're the street you grew up on, your pet's first name, we'll tell you your porn star name or elven name or whatever. Well, guess what? You just revealed some information that's often used as one of those challenge questions. Who was your first grade teacher? What was the name of your first pet? Even when you do things like have a photo of you with a pet, that might be your first pet. You're starting to say something or, oh, I really miss my pet spot. He passed away 20 years ago. You're giving away information. If you post vacation photo, hey, look at me. I'm down in Puerto Rico. I'm having a great time. And you post, post you on the beach this afternoon. Well, guess where I know you aren't? At home. So we give away all sorts of information. People should be more careful about how much they put out there. At a minimum, consider your social media posts should be limited to ideally friends or friends of friends. But when you make it worldwide public, you're sharing a lot of information. And these attackers, these people who are looking for vulnerabilities, they have a lot of time and now additional technical tools to go source through that and use that to find your vulnerability. Oh uh, yeah, no, abs yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm a very careful social media user, especially my early 20s where I was just realized I was just posting stuff like, oh crap, yeah, you're right. I'm just volunteering information without realizing. Ever since then, I've been more cautious. I try to treat it like a public room. Some very public, low risk, that's why I personally do. I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying um oh, okay, I'm at um and trust me, I know people and sad is this with my generation, they share their tag where they're at, which hotel, and if they're really, really ig ignorant for for a nice word, they even put the room number. So what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you posting tagging this stuff? And one of them tagged my place one time i told him don't tag my area take that take that post off Both me you're gonna have problems i'm normally not this um aggravate coming aggressive but that one i had to because i was exposing my information to social media i said that post needs to be taken down i said oh i don't mean i don't care what you meant take that down there are hackers out you know there's hackers there are scammers out there all it's going to take is one. No, take it down. Yeah. And me and a friend got to an argument on, over that. I said, how will you like it when I post your mother, the address, even the door, unlocking the door, or even showing um, door combinations? You want me to do that? That you're that's pretty close to what you're doing right now, you know. And I got I got to a very heated argument because of because of that. I so said, you what you're doing, you're exposing me to uh, people out there, and all they need is just a a thread of hope. They can get more, more, more until they get the prize. What's that prize? Your personal information, financial assets. So you have to be careful what you post. And I hate to say it, the uh, the other generation, I'm not sure if they're even learning that because they post so much. I mean, people share more than ever in social media, more than ever. Before it was a bit tamed, when Facebook was a thing, if I'm going to age myself a little further, MySpace was a thing. And well, I didn't get into well, I the dot com thing. I was too young to even participate extensively with a computer. I was... I was still in grade school when that happened at dot com. Interesting time. I saw a documentary on that, but I I, I don't want to drag it down there. Interesting time. That's all I'm gonna say about the dot com bubble. Um, let's see. So what is it gonna take for us to flourish during this during this revolution? I mean, to get us, I mean, of course, ideally get most most these humans placed into a updated job. I mean, what we have to do is to get there. I know it's about networking, upgrade um, skills, or being open-minded. Is there anything else you can add to that? 
Certainly. We as a society will definitely flourish because what we've seen historically is that before and after a technological change, post-change, there is more, more accessibility. There is lower cost for things. There's more services. There's more options. But the risk, as we noted earlier, it's the handful of people who had the before jobs that aren't needed after. So all of us, and we said it's not just binary. You're a farm worker. You're not a farm worker. It's all of us are going to see our jobs start to have certain tasks eroded. And so this is where we want to focus on those skills that can't be replaced. And as you're alluding to, it's a lot of the personal skill. It is strategy. It is critical thinking. It is creativity. It's the interpersonal skill, networking and negotiating and leadership, communication, teamwork. This is key. Now you might be saying, well, communication, can't AI just write it for me? Yes, it can. But you need to think about AI, I need you to write this email. How do I want to write the email? Do I want to write it in almost a threatening way? Hey, you need to do this or else. Do I need to write it in a more respectful way? Hey, I really appreciate if you could do this. Do you need to write it in a way that I think you might not be happy, so I really have to write in a more convincing way and understand what your needs are and align to it. And you can't just say, AI, do this and make it happen. Maybe for a paragraph, but our communication isn't just one paragraph or never talking again. And so it's really larger thinking about those relationships and communication and interactions. Again, the leadership, maybe you can write a speech or help you write it, but leadership isn't just a speech, it is about a holistic vision and moving a group of people forward. So those are the skills we really do want to be working on, as well as again technical skills. By technical, I don't mean programming per se. It's the, we don't need farmers, we need people who are social media experts, learn how social media works. It's obviously a contrived example. So look at what the jobs are, look at what the mechanical skills are for those jobs, and start to train up. That could be by reading, that could be by listening to podcasts, taking courses on things like Coursera, as you mentioned, or some of the alternatives, taking formal courses, courses through adult training, maybe at a community college or a Y or other places, online, in person. We really want to be proactive in building these skills, both the mechanical skills and the interpersonal skill. And that's going to greatly increase our chances for success. Yep, you know, human interaction is still very important. That's not going to be obsolete. That's for sure. Maybe how we communicate will be different, but you know, we humans are social beings. Um, if you were to talk to depress me about humans being social beings, I would hate that. But as someone who is more enlightened and willing to talk to people, it definitely more. I'm definitely more outgoing than I, was, than I was when I was younger. Thank goodness we could evolve. We could change. Yeah, um, human interaction, networking is more important than ever. And yeah, I mean, and of course, you know, AI can only do so much, right? AI is great for certain things. Um, I think customer service jobs are still going to be around until AI learn how to perfect that because not all customers know how to ask help, at least clearly. That's still going to need a human touch to it. But it comes to simple things like, oh, change my payment information. Well, sometimes even AI could do that. I mean, to, to some extent. Um, but of course, if the AI can't process that, then of course we have the human being. So again, just skill up, embrace the change. I'm sure this is not going to be the last major disruption ever. I'm sure it's, I think the next disruption is going to be what? Um, holograms, maybe? maybe? Yeah, maybe something like that. That probably be the next disruption. I, I don't know. I'm, I am not no Shadamas or predictive, but I won't be surprised if it's something like that. Um, you know, holograms are used to a very, very limited fashion, but I'm sure that's just going to expand in time. They were used for concerts, especially with dead celebrities. You no, know, hey, they're, they're immortalized in a sense. So, you know, it, it's a time just to find skills that shoots your personal strengths. And of course, that's in need with a society as well it cannot be always about you um i know that's difficult to very individualistic people to grasp that but it's not always about you it's about how you can service others and a great skill you know problem engineering is mostly is a 99 percent scam just like he said uh but it's problem but is creating good prompts is part of the job yeah part of it but it's not i'm sure it's not gonna be the whole thing oh forget it i would have been i would have been a millionaire by now Okay, I could just teach you how to throw those good prompts. 
Um, you know, there's a bit of an art to that. There's a bit of art of guiding AI to what you want. You got to learn to communicate with AI, obviously, because if you have a vague prompt like I did, I didn't get what I want with the turkey thing. You know, it was comical. I was trying to have a live turkey do a prayer, but instead it was a turkey already cooked with a prayer. <laughs> it was already dead. It was something humorous. I said, you know, I'm going to keep that because it's something humorous. And that reminds me of where I was at at one time. Not creating good prompts to guide AI to create artwork that I exactly wanted. So that's all. It's, you know, learning takes time and take um yeah take some courses on that um coursera is relatively affordable compared to a to a certain college degree or definitely the scam universities that wants thousands of dollars pretty much up front so it's probably like 50 60 dollars a month if i'm not mistaken probably changes you know i'm sure these things have changed but don't quote me on that um, i'm not gonna plug in coursera to this um link of the episode i'll plug in i'll plug in Mark stuff, that's for sure. That's what's going to be in the description because he has at least two products that I'm sure is going to be very helpful, especially if you want to level up your professional and even personal um, life. Yeah, I'm sure it's not just professional um, because some of it are transferable, like communication or how to talk to difficult people. That could be used personally. So when you can, uh, you know, like a family member or a friend that you get to, that you bump heads a lot, you can find a way to talk differently because if you keep doing the same thing and expect different results that's the fundamental definition of, of insanity so that's just one example about how to talk to a boss a different co-worker and transfer that to your more difficult friend or relatives so all right enough of me yammering um yeah i think this is a good time to do a plug-in because i think these tools are very helpful and i already said i'm gonna start buying the book real soon i'm sure there's things i need like networking i need improving that and see what are leadership skills I need to learn before I can become a leader myself. That's just me. You might have different needs. Uh, and the funny thing about this book is I could say that it's not a, a linear kind of book. I overheard you said that in one podcast. Said, That's good because some people just need something right away. You're not going to read through all the career planning. Who knows? They probably want just a promotion to um leadership. What what do they need for that? And you even got the myth of the alpha male. Oof, that might offend a couple of previous guests, but oh well. It's like you said, be tough. Well, we have to be tough on this one. As that's just one. That's one of many things. Um, when it comes to yeah, it's broken up very very concise and clear in a. The book is beautifully designed. It's why with a bunch of simple but very clear icons that we can know what they're talking about. So let me just plug in and, of course, feel free to chime in. Um, this one's the career, the career toolkit. And it's broken up to yeah, yep, 10, chap 10 chapters. And it's separated by three sections, really. Career, leadership management, and interpersonal dynamics. Oh, yeah. Some people definitely need help with interpersonal dynamics. I think that's a foundation. To, okay, Margaret, that's a foundation before you can even increase, um, I don't know, your goals, aspirations, your career, and even leadership. If you don't know how to talk to people, well, you're not going to be liked. And your chances of doing well on the job is going to be very small. And chance of promotion, forget it. That That's fantasy at that point. If you don't know, you don't understand interpersonal dynamics. It used to be my problem when I was a teenager, but... Thank God I um, correct most of that. So, and he also has an app too that I think it's very, very good for you. This is, of course, for your professional folks. And this one gives you top tips. Instead of scrolling through a book or even listening to an hour long podcast, don't ignore this one though. <laughs> for business authors, podcasters, bloggers, and other content creators, it helps you retain things you need. You know, gives you highlights, easy access for what you need um, in real time, even networking tips. So, you know, anything else you want to add about those two products? I think it's going to be a great need in terms of leveling up. Well, thank you for mentioning them. You're right. The book, we have 10 chapters. Each chapter is a different skill. Skills like networking, negotiating, career planning, leadership, interviewing, key skills that we all need that most people never actually sat down and taught us. And as you said, the book, you don't have to read start to finish. You could say... I want to start with my networking skills. I know I need to get better at that. Jump right to chapter eight. Skip the first couple hundred pages. Go to chapter eight. Read that chapter in 30 minutes. Now you are ready, <clears throat> ready to network. And so you can read parts of the book 
pick up the part you need, use it, put it down, go to another part when that's appropriate for you. The app, so the Brain Bump app, and this is a completely free app. It is a companion app for the book and for other books, blogs, podcasts. So we continually add new content and it takes the key things. If you went through my book with a highlighter, well, all of those highlights are in the Brain Bump app. So you download the app for free from Android or iPhone stores. You put the app in your pocket, you add the tips from my book, from this podcast, from that blog, from whatever sources you want. Or if we don't have it, if you read Kindle books, you can import your Kindle highlights or you can just manually add your own tips that you want. So now you have them all in your pocket and you can access them one of two ways, either just in time. So for example, if you're going off to some conference and you're saying, I need these networking tips right now as I'm walking into the conference, pull out the app, open it, everything's tagged by topic. So you say, get me networking. And now you've got the tips within second. Or you might just say, you know, I really want to get better at my communication skills. Now I can't say as soon as you walk up to me, wait, hold on, I have to open the app and see what I'm supposed to do before I talk to you. But I just want to be reminded of them because how often do we listen to a podcast or read a book and then within days or weeks, we forgot it all. So you can set up to get like a daily affirmation. It's like, getting a daily Bible verse, except it's from these books and blogs and other sources. And each day go, all right, that's a good tip. And then you just swipe it away. You don't even have to open the app, but by seeing it over and over, it will reinforce it and you'll remember it better and you'll start to use it more often. Completely free, the Brain Bump app. And of course the book that that's available for purchase at a pretty low price on Amazon. You can get the ebook, the physical book, whatever works for you. Well, for a millennial, I definitely like the physical book because I like to take My eyes will need a break from the darn screens. So that's just me. Um, I'm definitely, and I always like a hardcover. They generally, they're generally more expensive than the, I don't call them soft cover, but you know, the flimsier normal types of books. I always like the hardcover ones because I know I tend to just be careless with them and they, they actually look nicer to me. And I could actually sort them more nicely to my book of collections. Um, sadly for you audio, you my background is just a AI art of a scrabbled brain. And I think that represents of a person who is fearing and thinking so many negative thoughts. That's why it's there. Um, yep, it's AI generated, of course. Um, I cannot. I am incapable of producing beautiful art myself. I could appreciate good art. I think I could do it alone. So that's more for the audio listeners. You need a bit of an imagery. It has a orange coating, yellow coating. Looks like periwinkle, that color. Magenta, purple. You know, it's like a, a thick... Sh- no, it's not a string. Like a bunch of color molecules just lining up. Just representing a human head. And in the back, just wires or brains going a bit haywire in there. That's why I picked it. Because I think some people's brains are doing that right now with this AI um, revolu- revolution. So, so just having more focus. And just like you said, repetition. These lines will probably look more beautiful and stay strong. Instead of being wobbly and all over the place. So... That's one reason why I mentioned this um, artwork. It's a bit abstract. That might taste personally, but I think that it conveys the point. So let's see. I hope you learned something, listeners, because this is very, very valuable. This is more my serious getting in depth into a topic kind of thing. And this is definitely transformative kind of um, stuff. I want to do this more often. I think this is helpful. I don't mind having fun or being a bit dramatic, but that's superficial. I mean, make you feel good, but I want you to become better, okay? That's why I do this political podcast, because I see so much misinformation and so much talking points from the left and the right, and me as a proud and registered independent. Yeah, there's things that need to be addressed. I don't think it's not being talked about, and I do my best to, to minimize the partisanship if I need to explain something. Sometimes I use partisanship just to explain a point. Sometimes the left wing will understand it. Sometimes the right wing will understand it another way. You know, I want you to become not just an interesting human being, but a more intelligent, fun human being too. We could do all, the, all those things. Our brains are malleable, not stuck. It's like a rock that takes so much hard work just to chip it. It's going to take work for us to shape our brains, but it's definitely doable if you train it and exercise it. Exercise is hard at first. But it gets easier, even mental ones. So that's all I'm going to leave you with. I hope you gain something out of this, listeners, because this is coming from an expert here, and he has a lot of valuable advice. Before I wrap this up, is there anything you want to add, Mark? I think we 
we covered a lot of the, the key points. For those who are maybe hearing this while you're driving or jogging, you may not go to the show notes. I'm just going to mention the URLs. For the book, the URL is thecareertoolkitbook.com. And there, not only can you learn more about the book, you can follow me on social media. I put out articles every week, and there's a bunch of free resources. You don't have to buy the book. You don't have to sign up for my email. You can get all those free resources, the blog posts. All of this is at thecareertoolkitbook.com. And the Brain Bump app, you can find it on the stores. You can also go to brainbumpapp.com, and you can follow links to the stores. There's a 90-second video showing how the app works so you can understand what it is. But that app is completely free, as is all the content, and that's at brainbumpapp.com. So yeah, he's not even forcing you to pay for it. See, that's benevolent capitalism <laughs> or freebieism. Not a real word, by the way. I'm just throwing that in there. Freemium, that's more of a real word. Freemium content, especially with the Brain Bump app. Me, I still do your purchasing books, and especially if a physical book, because I like to just, I like to take a break from the screen, like I said, and but I'm not going to regurgitate that um, any further. All that he has mentioned, that's going to be in the link description as well. His social media, of course, on um, both of the products, um, the Brain Bump app and the career toolkit now of course i always do that at standard practice and whatever other social medias i have um, access to to just share with them because of me i believe in the more options you have the more likely you're gonna do them the easier i make it you know make these easier is a big encouragement for many people and i try to do it as much as i can and then if you want any feedback please provide me feedback and there's probably a few ways i'm not realizing i'm being thick-headed on because i'm not paying attention you know you help me out listeners you help me out really so with that out of the way with that out of the way like comment share subscribe or follow subscribes for youtube terminology and follow is rumble terminology and then for a cast well, I forget the button because I'm going to disown that hosting thing pretty soon. Once I'm done with this season, I'm going to a much better um, host. I'll let you know when I make that change. And it might mostly be better for you because it's more podcast friendly than ACAST. I'll tell you that much. That's a little bit of a hint. It starts with buzz. That's it. That's the only hint I'm going to give you. So with that out of the way, you have a blessed day, afternoon, or night.